Congregational Church of North Brookfield. Can we please all stand and we'll start our morning with some praise and worship. Okay. Oh, you all look ready.
all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God One more time, I love you, Lord I love you, Lord Oh, your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will see of the goodness of God I love you. 
Good morning. Just a few announcements before we move into prayer. Um, one is our Thanksgiving dinner is coming up um, on November 25th on Thanksgiving Day. We still need people to cook some things, and we still need people to help out, and we still need people if you want to have a food uh, delivered to you or to come. Just talk to Crystal right here. Just stand. Talk to Crystal right after. Okay. Um, it's a really important outreach, so if you can help cook something, just talk with Crystal and she can tell you what you can do and what scale of, of that. It doesn't have to be a lot, but it, anything will help. Uh, other announcements, you'll see that we have our Christmas tree here and uh, we have these stars on the giving tree. Each of these stars, we've, we have 145 stars, we're down to 113, and we've committed to gifting, you know, $25 for each of these stars. So th when we come in next week, it would be really nice to see no stars left on that tree. Um, but here's how it works. Don't do this. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah, I, that's a terrible example. I'm, I'm doing it. Yeah, terrible example. I'm doing it. I'm doing it publicly because this is a car, one that I've taken, Laurie. So if you want to see a star come down off of the tree, talk to Laurie Drake right there, or put a $25 gift or an increment of in your offering and just label it as so. Or you can go online and select the giving tree and do it that way. But we really want to see those stars disappear, okay? And this is mine, I'll give it to you later, but know that I... Oh, she doesn't trust me oh. either. <laughs> wow, okay. That a boy. That's called accountability, I wow. like that. <laughs> okay, I won't do what I did. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so please do that. Um, all right, we're at the place in our service where we take prayer requests. If you have a request that's not urgent, that doesn't need to be you know, uh, shared with everyone right now, then just pull out your phone if you want to do that right now, or later send an email. There's also a prayer card um, and contact information. If you want to fill that out, put it in the offering, then people will be praying for that as well, okay? Um, all right, with that, I'm picking up the wrong thing here. Let me share with you some of the prayer requests that I have right now, and, um, and then I'll take some from you, the, the ones that need to be shared. Um, we want to continue to pray for, for Ray and Evelyn. Ray is at home uh, and uh, on hospice care. Uh, the deacons will be going over to his house later uh, after church today. Uh, to just pray over him and to anoint him with oil. But, but please be praying um, for Ray. Uh, Maria Evans is having her surgery on Tuesday. We want to be lifting uh, up her for this kidney stone that she has. And then she has more things going on, shots to help her back coming up as well. So let's keep Maria in prayer. Jim and Carol Chaplin are doing okay. Uh, Jim is on palliative care and homebound right now. We want to be lifting them up. And Mary McGrail's arm is continuing to heal, but still needs more healing, so we'll keep praying. Um, and uh, Ashley and uh, Steve, Ashley is being induced. Uh, and, and I understand Steve has some kind of a monitor strapped to him. No. <laughs> so they can share the experience. No. Uh, so let's, but let's be praying for Ashley as they're inducing her this morning. And we want to continue to pray for Heather Downey. She's home from the hospital, still on oxygen, but she is home, and we want to be lifting her up, as well as Sue Joy's mom, who's uh, on hospice as well. Other requests that are, you know, of an urgent nature. Oh, I, I have Carter on my other page here. Yes. Yes. Thanks. I saw that Facebook post. 
Yeah. Okay, then my sister, if you know, if you don't remember, she works in Westboro in the nursing home that she works at, watches our services, and I'm actually going to visit them tomorrow. Uh, kind of cool. All right, anything else before? Yes. said Kim. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's let's pray and we'll conclude corporately with the Lord's prayer. Father, we just thank you for your grace in our lives. It's so clear from just these requests how we all struggle and have trials that we face. And so we lift all of them up, those that are, that are here in front of us, those that are in our hearts, those that are online or on Zoom. And Lord, we just pray that you would walk alongside of us, that you would give us wisdom as we walk through these trials. And Lord, we lift up to you, Ray and Evelyn, and we ask that you would be with them. We pray, Lord, for Maria, and we ask for... Uh, a successful surgery and treatments for her back. Lord, we pray for Jim and, and Carol that, that you would be with them as well. And, and Lord, we lift up Mary and, and her arm and we ask for continued and complete healing. Lord, we pray for Ashley right now. We pray for every aspect of all that's going on. And, and we pray for the joy to come. We anticipate it together. Lord, we pray for Heather, and we ask that you uh, would be with her as well, and uh, that she would not have to stay on the oxygen long, and, and Lord, that she would be completely healed. And we lift up Sue Joy's mom to you, Lord. Uh, and Lord, we, we lift up to you Carter, a newborn with uh, diabetes already, and we just ask that, that this uh, little guy, that you would uh, be with him, touch him, touch his family. Lord, we, we pray for, um, for Joan's family, and I lift up to you, Carol, as well, especially right now, that you would comfort her. We pray, Lord, for uh, Noreen's grandson, Aiden, as he mourns the loss of his grandfather, and we just lift him up to you. And Lord, we pray for Kim. We pray over the cancer that she has. We pray over so many in our congregation and in our contact that are wrestling with this terrible illness. And we just pray for wisdom to walk through the trial, for healing, and for your grace. And Lord, as we look to your word this morning, may you open our eyes, may you convict us, may you transform us, may you challenge us deeply. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So today we are back into the letter of James, uh, looking at just verses 9 to 11. Three verses. We'll be out of here today. Um. So there's this, there's this guy, very wealthy, 
And, and, and he prays sincerely for days and weeks and months that he might be able to take just some of his riches with him. And, and he believes after praying substantially that he hears the voice of God and says, okay, you can take one chest of wealth with you when you go. And so he sets up this trunk in the attic directly over his bed so that when he passes and he makes these arrangements to be sure that, that he passes away in his bed and his thought is that when he passes and his, and his soul rises up, he would grab the chest in the contents of the chest and continue on his journey. And he's adamant. He, he thinks this is going to happen. And, and the day comes. The day comes where he's on his deathbed. He's in his bed. And he passes away. No sooner had he passed away, because everybody is standing around him, his loving family, but as soon as the lights go out, they all look at each other, and they race up to the attic to see. They flip open the trunk, and it's all there, every bit of it. And his wife says, I told him to put it in the basement. <laughs> okay. All right. There's a lot. There's a lot of bad theology in that joke. So, but, but there's a lot that we compare and contrast often about the rich and the poor. How many movies can we think of? Like the first one that comes to mind is A Christmas Carol. Ebenezer Scrooge. How he went from being a selfish, rich person and after being visited by you know, the, the messenger of the past, the present, and Christmas future, it's the Christmas future that, that changes his heart. It's the Christmas future. It's the, the vision of a judgment that causes him to have regret, to enter into a place of repentance, and to be completely changed. Ebenezer Scrooge, Scrooge had a shot over the bow moment. A shot over the bow. It's a, it's a term that's been used ever since ships floated the sea. A, a shot over the bow, and, and I thought it had changed. I'm talking about a, another slide. A shot over the bow, ever since boats could, could, could sit on the water and have weapons on them, it's a, it's a shot over the bow that says, change now. Stop now, decease now, turn now, or face the consequences because the next one will not be over the bow. And so what we're dealing with today in this letter of James is, is, is the issue of rich and poor. What we're dealing with in James today is a shot over the bow. Before we get to James, though, I think it's important to look at some of the other verses in Scripture, the other places in Scripture, because James is writing not in a vacuum. James is writing from a deep knowledge of the Old Testament. James is writing from a deep understanding and knowledge of the sayings of his brother, half-brother, Jesus. So, so James isn't writing in a vacuum. He's writing from a knowledge and experience, and much of it comes from Scripture. So we, we have to look at Scripture to understand what James would be saying. So take a look at what Isaiah says. And look at this, Isaiah chapter 40. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? And here it is. All flesh is grass and all its beauty like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fade. 
When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Okay, so all week long, as I'm looking at this verse, I'm reminded constantly of a song, a a friend of mine, a friend of some of us, uh, Robbie Cormier, wrote, uh, 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 did an album, a Christian album, many years ago, where he put different words of scripture to music. And then I took this book when I taught Sunday school at the church that I was attending, and I played this song over and over and over and over. It was like, like stuck in my head. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. The grass with that's basically it, and it keeps repeating and repeating. And I thought, since I've dealt with this all week long, so can you. So, so let's share the experience. Uh, I just want this to somehow get into your head. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Okay, so, so then we find in Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, talking about riches, he, he writes in chapter 9, thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this. If you're going to boast, boast in this. That you understand and know God. That the Lord practices steadfast love and righteousness in the earth. If we're going to boast, that's what we can boast about. Paul would later say that he boasts in the cross. Uh, For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Okay, so in Psalms, talking about the rich and the poor, in Psalm 49 it says, Do not be afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. Interesting contrast. It's not being favorable to the rich, is it? The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. I don't know how I'm going to get this in your head, but, um, but I'm going to work on it. So in Matthew, Matthew writes this. No one can serve two masters. Either they will hate one, either they will hate one and love the other, or they'll be devoted to one and despise the other. Another verse in Matthew says uh, in chapter 13, as for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the world and it proves unfruitful. Here Jesus is talking about seeds sown on different ground and one of the types of ground that the seeds are on that get taken away are those that are deceived by riches. Withers the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Thank you, Mark. I put that slide in there just for you. So, the Gospel of Mark has this to say in chapter 10. And as he was setting out on his journey, 
a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. He leaves out something. Uh, and, but, the, but the rich person says, teacher, all these I've kept from my youth, I'm in. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Disheartened, the man went away sorrowful, for he had many possessions. So here's a guy that's rich, thinking he's following, in, 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 in one of the other Gospels, the, the account says that he asks which commandment, you know, which command should he follow? So, but, but what Jesus has left out is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. But he sneaks it back in by saying, if you love me with all your heart, mind, and soul, it won't be hard for you to sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. But he couldn't do it. The snares of being rich. The Gospel of Mark in chapter 10 says that it, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Just envision what that might look like. A camel through the eye of a needle. Now, now some have said that there's a gate, uh, and there's actually nothing historical to back that statement up, that there's a gate that, that a camel can fit in. Um, but at any rate, we're not studying that. We're just talking about the idea of riches and eternal life seem to be in conflict. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Okay, so what does Luke say? Here's some things that Luke says in chapter 6. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are rich. Not very favorable. In, in Luke chapter 12, we find this. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, you made me a judge or arbitrator over you. And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against the covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. I'll just read that again. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentiful. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul. You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. And, and how does it end? It's, it's shocking. But God th said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Matthew would say, store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where moth and do not destroy, where moth and rust do not destroy. And, and, and so, again, we see this hardness towards someone rich. Luke chapter 14 says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. I right, saw so another story, Luke in chapter 16. Now, again, these are all things that James would have heard about, that James perhaps witnessed. These are all things that he was shown. Uh, and so in Luke, we find another story. There was a rich man clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted uh, sumptuously every day 
And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. What's interesting is that this is called a parable, but I'm not so sure, because no other parable has a name of somebody in it. All the parables have a certain man, a certain person. But, but here, this person is named. Prior to this, he's talking about the Pharisees and their love for money. Um, so this, is, this, this parable has a name, so, but we're not going to analyze this too much. We're just getting the idea. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus by his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm in anguish in this flame. But in this flame, he still wants Lazarus to serve him. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received good things and Lazarus in a like manner bad things. But now he's comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm is fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And Jesus, being prophetic in the sense about himself, he said, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. So, again, we're, we're seeing this sharp contrast between the rich and the poor. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands. Hey, it's getting better, it's getting better, it's working. Okay, so Timothy and John in the book of Revelation has this to say. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. 1 Timothy chapter 6. In, in Revelation in chapter 3, it says, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked, not very kind towards the rich. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Okay, so, all right, finally, let's talk about these three verses in James. But before we do that, <laughs> before we do that, look at this verse in Acts chapter 11. Acts is a book that's written by Luke. It's like the second installment of, of Luke's gospel. And Luke is more historical than any of the other writers. And we find this written in Acts. And one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. And then Luke puts in what he often does, a little bit of archaeological evidence, a little bit of historical content, and he says that this took place in the days of Claudius. Well, Claudius was in charge in Rome from 41 to 54 AD. James was executed in 62 AD, and this letter was in well circulation prior to his death. So it seems as though that, that James is writing during a time of persecution, and that James is writing during a time of economic depression. James is writing at a time when there is a great disparity between the rich 
and the poor. So we need to look at that and have that in mind as we look to the text. Okay, so here we're looking at verses 2 to 15. Remember when we started, we said James is divided out into sections where it's most often introduced, my brothers. So here is this whole section. Now we started looking at trials. We did that already. We looked at trials. And then we saw that trials brought us to this place of wisdom for trials. If you're going through trials, ask for wisdom. God will give you wisdom for what? For dealing with the trials. God will give you wisdom in your trials. That's where we've been. This is what we're looking at today, the rich and the poor. And then interestingly enough, in this section, the next thing that takes place is James talks about trials again. So we have what I call often bookends. We have trials and we have trials. And and, and that, I believe, is a literary technique for James to say, this is a bookend. Pay attention to what's between the bookends. And so if we were to draw a line between what we did last time about wisdom and what we'll talk about today during about the rich and the poor, we see some interesting things. So, for example, both begin with imperatives of let. We have an imperative, let him ask God, let the lowly brother boast. So there's this parallel between these two verses sandwiched between verses about trials. Well, it's interesting that there's contrasting opposites in both. One is faith and doubt, and the other is rich and poor. Contrasting opposites in both things. And we find that faith and poor receive something. So those who have faith, and it will be given to them, and those who have, are poor will be exalted. So we see that, the, that on one side of that contrast, in both of them, faith and poor have a positive benefit. And, and then doubt and rich don't have a positive benefit. So we see for the person must not suppose that he'll receive anything. He's double-minded and unstable. And, and then we see that the rich that he's talking about will fade away in the midst of pursuits. So not a positive output. And, and then we see that the focus is on the negative, the whole focus in each one. Look at the size of the content on the negative. Look at the size of the content on the negative. Do you see the mirroring that's being done here? And then we see that the introduction, or I'm sorry, that they both use nature. One, a wave of the sea, and the other, the scorching wind and the heat. So they're both using this idea of nature. They both enter into the second part of things with the same intro. Uh, They both lean in with this, uh, the Greek word is gar, uh, but it's for that and for. So that that there's this idea of for. And other, one last interesting point, the number of words in the first part of the white, 55, Number of words in the second part, 54. It it, it seems as though James is saying something very important is linked between the two, and we'll pick up the rest of that next week when we look at trials once again. But right now, here we go. We're finally leading in to talking about verses 9 through 11. But before we do that... You knew it was coming. (laughs) The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Okay, so let's look now at what James writes in these three verses. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. 
What's troubling here to the person trying to interpret the original language is this question. It's pretty clear that the lowly, the reference, that's a reference to the poor, that the lowly are referenced as brother. So it's very clear that James, when he's writing to the poor in this text, that he's addressing Christians, brothers. But it doesn't say, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich brother in his humiliation. Uh, So some would say that the rich that he's writing to are not Christians. But others would say, grammatically, he doesn't have to say brothers twice. It could apply to both. And so the answer is we don't know. We do know that he's writing to Christians that are in the poor category. We do not know if he's writing to Christians or non-Christians in the rich category. But it doesn't really matter because it seems as though from what we've been reading everywhere else that the rich and the poor, the outcome is the same. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flowers fall and its beauty perishes. Again, James is writing out of nature, and, and if you lived in Palestine, and we've, we've been to Israel, and, and there's this phenomenon that can happen where the winds bring apar- upon the land a scorching heat, and it actually will wither plants and flowers in a matter of hours. Think of what would happen if you just put your hair dryer on full tilt on, on a, a number of uh, flowers living or cut, how fast that they would wither. And, and, and so James is drawing upon nature. Everyone's reading it saying, wow. And, and what we've seen is this fast destruction of things. And then this last statement. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Well, if he's writing to non-Christian rich people, I guess theologically it can fit. But if he's writing to Christians that are rich, then there's some perplexing things going on. I don't know, maybe, maybe heaven has something like uh, just uh, last week, I think on November 10th, the IRS came out with new tax bracket guidelines. You know, if you are making $10,275 or less, then you're in the 10% tax bracket, and you're not considered rich. Um, but, but when do you become rich? When do you enter into the place where you're rich? Many of us might think we're not rich. But if we spent any time in a third world country, we would come back saying, we're rich. So, so where is the index, you know, of all of that? Does heaven have a kind of an index where we just come out with new guidelines? Lucky for you, you're now not rich. You can enter in. Maybe, maybe the guy would, would have gone up and got his stuff through the trunk. Is there some kind of a guideline? Because if we're not careful, if we read Scripture selectively, we might come up with, some kind of a conclusion that the poor are in all of them and that the rich are out all of them. And yet we don't see that when we look at all of Scripture. Here's a story of Zacchaeus, and this is found in the Gospel of Luke. And and I'm not going to read the whole story, but I'll, I'll, I'll just talk about it for a moment. The first verse, though, says that he entered Jericho, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. So it doesn't matter what we think the tax bracket is. Zacchaeus is in trouble based on what we just read 
in James and what we've seen in other verses. But, but what happens is Zacchaeus wants to meet with Jesus. Zacchaeus is, you know, we all know the story. He's, he's vertically challenged. And, um, and so he climbs a tree so that he can see Jesus. Jesus walks under the tree, looks up, notices him, and says, today I'll have dinner with you. And, and, and so Zacchaeus is so transformed by this that Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I will give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone, I'll restore it four times. We just saw a tax collector, a story rather, where the rich man, doesn't say tax collector, where the rich man goes to Jesus, what should I do to be saved? And what did Jesus say? Sell half of what you own and give it to the poor and follow me? He didn't. He said, sell it all. Why? Because he didn't have a heart for God. And yet Zacchaeus does, and Zacchaeus is going to give half of what he has away and restore any kind of fraudulent activity four times and, and my guess is that Zacchaeus is going to go on and use the half of the wealth that he maintains to continue to bless, to continue to help the poor. Zacchaeus is this changed life. And how do we know that he's changed? Jesus says it. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And so when we read verses like this, we have to be careful that we don't develop a theology from a single verse or from a selected verse, but from the the whole of Scripture. We are not saved by being poor, but perhaps the likelihood of us wanting to depend upon God in our poverty is, is a help, and perhaps being rich is a stumbling block to some. So I can't not bring up my favorite chapter and verse in all of Scripture. Uh, John chapter 14 tells us exactly how heaven is obtained, and Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. It's not about a, a tax bracket of, or a, a bracket of rich or poor. It's about knowing Jesus. We find in First Peter this, since you have been born again, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our Lord stands forever. The grass withers, the flowers fall, But the word of our God stands forever. So in in just wrapping up this comment, really, that's all we've been looking at this morning from James about rich and poor. We understand now that that the economic situation is probably dire, that it's during the time of a famine, that there are some who are rich and some who are poor, and there's an uneven distribution, and that Jesus is calling the Christians through the writing of James to use your wealth wisely. It's a shot over the bow. But how do we have a cross perspective? That's what we talked about before in trials, how do we have a cross perspective of what we have? And so I just put a few things together to walk through, a few questions to challenge me, to challenge you. Are you envious of what others have? That's dangerous if you are, and I think we all are. You know, sometimes Annie and I, we enjoy 
um, looking on Zillow for houses that we will never buy. You know, and they're all one-bedroom studio things, right? No, no, we, we look for the price tag that's like, and, and we, did, we just went away last weekend at Hampton Beach, and, and we poked around to see what was for sale around us that we would never in a zillion years um, there's, there is some property that we really liked. It was 19.6 million. Um, <laughs> yeah, just tossing that out there, right? But, but why is it that we're always envious of what we don't have and what we're envious about is having more? And, and I think that this text applies to the poor and to the wealthy. The poor are given encouragement. They're going through a difficult time. And what James is writing about is called the great reversal. Scripture, throughout Scripture, we see this great reversal. The last will be first. The weak will be strong. The, the poor will be rich. We see this reversal that's going on in Scripture and, and so when we, when we think about the poor, we should be encouraged in our place that, that there will be a reversal. That's encouraging. Um, but the next one, um, well, uh, two more, sorry. The, the next question, we've already talked about this, is are we concerned about the contractions or the birth? Are we focused on the pain and the trials that we're currently going through, or are we focused on the encouragement that in the end that we will be exalted? Are we looking at that? And, and here's one I think is important that is overlooked. You know, if we see ourselves as poor, or wherever we are, to the person that we're envious about, the question is, are we concerned for them? You know, are we genuinely concerned for the rich because it seems as though there is a great amount of warning and a great amount of difficulty to those who are. Are we, are we thinking about how to reach those who have more than us? Or are we just envious? The gospel is for rich and poor. Are we convicted to represent ourselves in Christ in such a way that no matter who is looking at us, those that have more, those that have less, that they would be drawn to the gospel, that they would be drawn to Christ? You know, are you rich? We just talked about it. It's relative. It depends on where you are. You know, somebody, somebody who goes to a third world country, you know, can see that, that we are wealthy. I remember when David went on a missions trip to uh, the Dominican Republic. Before he went, he would look through cupboards and, 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 and closed doors and open cupboards and closed doors and he would say what we all say. There's nothing to eat in this place. And then he goes to the Dominican for a few weeks and he comes back and he sees the wealth in our cupboards and he's changed by it. We are rich and, and we all have the ability to, to give and to be generous. Are you concerned for the poor and the less fortunate? Should we, we should be concerned for those above us in the economic scale and below us in the economic scale. Are, are we a generous giver? Regardless of where we are, on a scale, are we a generous giver? The, the story is told about this family at a church that is very, you know, has very, very little. But they attend church regularly. And one day, the, the, the pastor of the church says, it's come to our attention that, that, that one of our parishioners, one of our, the people in our congregation, has very, very little and, and we, for the next month, are going to take extra giving, and we're going to give it to this family that has very, very little. We're not saying who this family is. We just say that we will give it to the appropriate family. 
And, and so this one family that doesn't have much, they, they go home and they, they pray and they start thinking, what can we do for this family? And, and so, so the, one of the kids says, well, I could sell a couple of my toys, a couple of my games. And, and the daughter says, well, I, I can sell a few of my things too. And, and the, the, the father says, well, I can pick up an extra job, you know, doing this. And, and the mother says, well, I can make some of these things. And, and for the whole month, they put together money and they put it in the offering plate. And at the end of the month, they've given $200 to this family who needs funds. And at the close of this campaign, they feel really good. And then in the evening of that same night, the pastor knocks on the door and says, you know, our church has been working for a month and we've put together $200 to give you. Yeah. Are we a generous giver? It doesn't matter where you are. Are you a generous giver? Are you controlled uh, by, there should be a what. <laughs> are you controlled by the hat that withers? The hat withers, the flowers fall. Um, I think that's a question that we should all ask. Are we controlled by the things that will wither? Don Henley you know, of the Eagles has a, has a song, and in that song, the lyrics of, uh, of Gimme, Gimme, What You've Got, in the lyrics, it, it says, there are no hearses with luggage racks. And trailer hitches, they don't have trailer hitches. They're not even an option. Lastly, wrapping things up, what's in your trunk? What's in your trunk? Is, is it riches that you're saving or, or is it perhaps the lives of others who don't know Jesus that do because of what you've been able to do? What's in your trunk? And while it could be funny, I think it's an important question to ponder. Where would you place your trunk? Would you put it in the attic with an expectation of going to heaven? Or do you not know? Or do you think that maybe the best place for you would be to put it in the trunk? <laughs> Let me tell you, the gospel is written for you. The gospel is written for all of us, and the gospel tells us that, I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I tell you the truth, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. For it's by grace that you've been saved through faith, and it's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. It's not by works so that no one can boast. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you are questioning where you are, question no more. Faith in Christ puts the trunk in the attic. Faith in Christ puts the trunk in the attic. What needs to change? Really seriously, what needs to change in your life? You know what it is. James says, ask for wisdom. Not to get out of it, but to ask for wisdom to work through it with God. So that you know when you get to the other side that he's the one who carried you. What needs to change? And lastly, what... What kind of a shot is going over your bow right now? You know, it may have nothing to do with rich or poor. It may have nothing to do with anything I've talked about. But you know that God is, is, is shooting something over your bow and saying, you're in danger right now. You're in grave danger right now. 
what kind of thing is God saying to you? What kind of shot over the bow is, is, is waking you up right now? Ask for wisdom. Ask for the grace of God to, to overpower that trial, to change that direction, to transform that behavior. Just ask. Let's pray. Father, I just pray over each of us, myself first, over the things that need to change. Lord, may I be generous. May I be mindful of those who have more but, but don't have you. May I be mindful of those who have less that know you and those that don't. May I be mindful and, and active over what to do. And, and Lord, may your name be glorified. May your name be lifted high. In your name we pray. Amen.
God's people said. Our closing hymn is 797. Please stand and... Our benediction this morning of the verse to take with us. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. So 1 Peter chapter 1. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like a flower of grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the Word of our Lord remains forever. And this Word is the good news that was preached to you. Let's pray. Father, as we go forward, may we proclaim this good news. Lord, may we be concerned with eternal things and not the things that wither and fall away. May we be concerned with those who have more than us. May we be concerned for those who have less. And, and may we walk well with you through our trials. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.